Welcome to the Thousand Nights and One Night. Now, when it was the eight hundred and forty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the caliph rejoiced at the recovery of Kut al and knew all was the doing of Lady Zubida, his cousin wife. Wherefore he was sore enraged against her, and held aloof from her a great while, visiting her not, neither inclining to or pardoning her. When she was certified of this, she was sore concerned for his wrath, and her face, that was wont to be rosy, waxed pale and wan, till, when her patience was exhausted, she sent a letter to her cousin, the commander of the faithful, making her excuses to him, and confessing her offences, and ending with these verses. I long once more the love that was between us to regain, that I may quench the fire of grief, and bait the force of bane. O lords of me, have ruth upon the stress my passion deals. Enough to me is what you doled of sorrow and of pain. Tis life to me, and deign you keep the trop, you deign to plight. Tis death to me, and troth you break, and fondest vows profane. Given I've sinned a sorrow sin, yet grant me ruth for naught. By Allah, sweeter is than friend, who is of pardon fain. When the Lady Zubida's letter reached the Caliph, and reading it he saw that she confessed her offence, and sent her excuses to him therefore, he said to himself, Verily all sins doth Allah forgive. Ay, gracious, merciful is he. And he returned an answer expressing satisfaction, and pardon and forgiveness for what was past, whereat she rejoiced greatly. As for Khalifa the fisherman, the Caliph assigned him a monthly sold of fifty dinars, and took him into a special favor, which would lead to rank and dignity, honor, and worship. Then he kissed ground before the commander of the faithful, and went forth with stately gait. When he came to the door, the eunuch Sandal, who had given him the hundred dinars, saw him, and knowing him, said to him, O fisherman, whence all this? So he told him all that had befallen him, first and last, whereat Sandal rejoiced, because he had been the cause of his enrichment, and said to him, Wilt thou not give me largesse of this wealth, which has now become thine? So Khalifa put hand to pouch, and, taking out a purse containing a thousand dinars, gave it to the eunuch, who said, Keep thy coin, and Allah bless thee therein, and marveled at his manliness, and all the liberality of his soul, for all his late poverty. Then, leaving the eunuch, Khalifa mounted the she-mule, and rode with the slave's hand on her crupper, till he came to his lodging at the khan, whilst the folk stared at him in surprise for that which had betided him of advancement. When he alighted from the beast, they accosted him and inquired the cause of his change from poverty to prosperity, and he told them all that had happened from first to last. Then he bought a fine mansion, and laid out thereon much money, till it was perfect in all points. And he took up his abode therein, and was wont to recite therein these two couplets. Behold, a house that's like the dwelling of delight, its aspect heals the sick, and banishes despite. Its sojourn for the great and wise appointed is, and fortune fair therein abideth day and night. Then, as soon as he was settled in his house, he sought him a marriage, the daughter of one of the chief men of the city, a handsome girl, and went in unto her, and led a life of solace and satisfaction, joyance and enjoyment, and he rose to passing affluence and exceeding prosperity. So when he found himself in this fortunate condition, he offered up thanks to Allah, exalted and exalted be he, for what he had bestowed on him of wealth exceeding, and of favors ever succeeding, praising his Lord with the praise of the grateful, and chanting the words of the poet. To thee be praise, O thou who show us unremitting grace, O whose universal bounties high and low embrace. To thee be praise from me, then deign accept my praise, for I accept thy boons and gifts with grateful soul in every case. Thou hast with favors overwhelmed me, benefits and largesse and gracious doles my memory ne'er ceaseth to retrace. All men from mighty main, thy grace and goodness drain and drink, and in their need thou only thou be them art refuge place. Thou heapest up, O Lord, thy mercy signs on mortal men, 
Thou pardonest man's every sin, though he be high or base. So for the sake of him who came to teach mankind in Ruth, prophet pure, truthful word scion of the noblest race, ever be Allah's blessing and his peace on him and all his aids and kin while pilgrims fare his noble tomb to face. And on his help meets one and all, companions great and good, through time eternal while a bird shall sing in shady wood. And thereafter, Khalifa continued to pay frequent visits to the Caliph Harun al-Rashid, with whom he found acceptance, and who ceased not to overwhelm him with boons and bounty, and he abode in the enjoyment of the utmost honor and happiness, and joy and gladness, and in riches more than sufficing in rank ever rising, brief, a sweet life, and a savory pure as pleasurable till there came to him the destroyer of delights and the sunderer of societies and extolled be the perfection of him to whom belong glory and permanence and he is the living the eternal who shall never die now i continue and according to the translator of this piece he says that the following story is the same story except that he prefers not amalgamating or the, as he did in the previous one so that you can get the full story in this way. This is Caliph. Caliph, the fisherman of Baghdad. There was once, in days of yore and in ages, and times long gone before in the city of Baghdad, a fisherman by the name of Caliph, a man of muckle talk and little luck. One day, as he sat in his cell, he bethought himself and said, There is no majesty, there is no might, save in Allah the glorious the great. When heaven I knew what is my offense in the sight of my Lord, and what caused the blackness of my fortune and my littleness of luck among the fishermen, albeit, and I say it, who should not, in this city of Baghdad, there is never a fisherman like myself. Now, he lodged in a ruined place called a con, to wit, an inn, without a door, and when he went forth to fish, he would shelter the net without basket or fish slicers, and when the folk would stare at him and say to him, O oh, Caliph, why not take with thee a basket to hold the fish thou catchest? He would reply, Even as I carry it forth empty, so would it come back, for I never managed to catch aught. One night he arose in the darkness before dawn, and taking his net on his shoulder, raised his eyes to heaven and said, Allah mine, O oh, thou who subjectest the sea to Moses, son of Imran, Give me this day my daily bread, for thou art the best of bread givers. Then he went down to the Tigris, and spreading his net, cast it into the river, and waited till it had settled down. When he hailed it in, and drew it ashore, but behold, it held nothing but a dead dog. So he cast away the carcass, saying, O oh, morning of ill doom, what a hansel is this dead hound, after I rejoiced in its weight. Then he mended the rents in the nets, saying, Neat must there after this carrion be fish in plenty, attracted by the smell, and made a second cast. After a while he drew it up and found in the net the huff of a camel it had caught in his meshes, and rent him right and left. When Caliph saw his net in the state, he wept and said, There is no majesty and there is no might in Allah save the glorious the great. I wonder what is my offense, and the cause of the blackness of my fortune, and the littleness of my luck of all folks, so that I catch neither catfish nor sprat, that I may broil on the embers and eat. For I dare say there is not in the city of Baghdad a fisherman like me. Then with abysmia he cast his net a third time, and presently drawing it ashore, found therein an ape scurvy and one-eyed, mangy and limping, hending an ivory rod in forehand. When Caliph saw this, he said, This is indeed a blessing opening. What art thou, O ape? Dost thou not know me? No, by Allah, I have no knowledge of thee. I am thy ape. What use is there in thee, O my ape? Every day, 
I give thee good morrow, so Allah may not open to thee the door of daily bread. Thou failest not of this, O one eye of ill omen. May Allah never bless thee. Needs must I pluck out thy sound eye and cut off thy whole leg, so thou mayest become a blind cripple, and I quit of thee. But what is the use of that rod when thou handest in thy hand? O Caliph, I scare the fish therewith, so they may not enter thy net. Is it so? Then this very day will I punish thee with a grievous punishment, and divide all manner of torments, and strip thy flesh from thy bones, and be at rest from thee, sorry bits of good that thou art. So saying, Caliph the fisherman unwound from his middle a strand of rope, and binding him to the tree by his side, said, Look ye, O dog of an ape, I mean to cast the net again, and if aught come up therein, well and good, but if it come up empty, I will verily and assuredly make an end of thee with the coolest tortures, and be quit of thee, thou stinking lot. So he cast the net, and drawing it ashore, found in it another ape. Glory be to God the Great. I was wont to pull naught but fish out of this tigress, but now it yielding nothing but apes. Then he looked at the second ape, and saw him fair of form and round of face, with pendants of gold in his ears, and a blue waistcloth about his middle, and he was like unto a lighter taper. So he asked him, What art thou? Thou also an ape? And he answered, saying, O Caliph, I am the ape of Abu al-Sadat, the Jew, the Caliph's shroff. Every day I give him good morrow, and he maketh a profit of ten gold pieces. Cried the fisherman, By Allah thou art a fine ape, not like the ill-omened monkey o' mine. So saying, he took a stick, and came down upon the sides of the ape till he broke his ribs, and he jumped up and down. And the, the other ape, the handsome one, answered him, saying, O Caliph, what will it profit thee to beat him? Thou, thou belabor him till he die. Caliph replied, How shall I do? Shall I let him wend his ways, that he may scare me the fish and his hang-dog face, and give me good evening and good to-morrow every day, so Allah may not open to me the day of daily bread? Nay, I will kill him and be quit of him, and I will take thee in his stead. So shalt thou give me good to-morrow, and I shall gain ten golden dinars a day. Thereupon the comely ape made an answer. I will tell thee a better way than that, and if thou hearken to me, thou shalt be at rest, and I will become thine ape in lieu of him. Asked the fisherman, And what dost thou counsel me? And the ape answered, Cast thy net, and thou shalt bring up a noble fish, never saw any of its like, and I will tell thee how thou shalt do with it. Replied Caliph, Look ye thou too. And I throw my net, and there came up therein a third ape, to be assured that he will cut the three of you into six bits. And the second ape rejoined, So be it, Caliph. I agree to this thy condition. Then Caliph, spread the net, and cast it, and drew it up, and behold, in it was a fine young barbel with a round head, as it were a milking pail, which when he saw his wits fled for joy, and he said, Glory be to God, what is this noble creature? Where yonder apes in the river, I had not brought up this fish. Quoth the seemly ape, O Caliph, and thou give ear to my reed, will bring thee good fortune. And quoth the fisherman, May God damn him who will gainsay thee henceforth. Thereupon the ape said, O Caliph, take some grass and lay the fish therein in the basket, and cover it with more grass, and take also somewhat of basil from the greengrocer's, and set it in the fish's mouth. Cover it with a kerchief, and push thee through the bazaar of Baghdad. Whoever beseeketh thee of selling it, sell it not, but thereon, till thou come to the market street of the jewellers and money changers. Then count five shops on the right hand side, and the sixth shop is that of Abu al Sadat, the Jew, the Caliph's shroff. When thou standest before him, he will say to thee, What seekest thou? And do thou make answer, I am a fisher white. I threw my net in thy name, and took this noble barbell which I have brought thee as a present. If I give thee aught of silver, take it not. 
but it little or mickle, for it will spoil that which thou wouldest do. But say to him, I want of thee not, save one word, that say to me, I sell thee my ape for thine ape, and my luck for thy luck. And the Jew say this, Give him the fish, and I shall become thine ape, and this crippled mangy one-eyed ape will be his ape. Caliph replied, Well said, O ape. Nor did he cease faring Baghdad boards and observing that which the ape had said to him, till he came to the Jew's shop and saw the shroff seated with eunuchs and pages about him, bidding and forbidding, and giving and taking. So he set down his basket, saying, O Sultan of the Jews, I am a fisher white, and went forth today to the Tigris, and casting my net in thy name, cried, This is for the luck of Abu al Sadat. And there came up to me this bani, which I have brought thee by way of a present. Then he lifted the grass and discovered the fish to the Jew, who marveled at its make, and said, Extol be the perfection of the most excellent creator. Then he gave the fisherman a dinar, but he refused it, and he gave him two. This also he refused, and the Jew stayed, not adding to his offer, till he made it ten dinar. But he still refused, and Abu al-Sadat said to him, By Allah, thou art a greedy one. Tell me what thou wouldst have, O Moslem, quoth Caliph. I would have of thee but a single word. When the Jew heard this, he changed color and said, Wouldst thou oust me from my faith? When thy ways? And Caliph said to him, By Allah, O Jew, not mattereth on thou become a Moslem or an Nazarene. Asked the Jew, Then what wouldst thou have me say? And the fisherman answered, Say I sell thee my ape for thy ape, and my luck for thy luck. And the Jew laughed, deeming him little of wit, and said by way of jest, I sell thee my ape for thy ape, and my luck for thy luck. Bear witness against him, O merchants, by Allah, O unhappy, thou art debarred from further claim on me. So Caliph turned back, blaming himself and saying, There is no majesty, and there is no might, save in Allah the glorious, the great. Alas, that I did not take the gold and fared on blaming himself in the matter of the money, till he came to the tigress, but found not the two apes, whereupon he wept and slapped his face, and strewed dust on his head, saying, But that the second ape wheedled me and put a cheat on me, the one-eyed ape had not escaped, and he gave not over weeping and wailing till heat and hunger grew sore on him. So he took the net, saying, Hmm, can well, let us make a cast, trusting in Allah's blessings. Be like I may catch a catfish or a barbel, which I may boil and eat. So he threw the net and waiting till it had settled, drew ashore, and found it full of fish. Whereat he was consoled and rejoiced, and busied himself with meshing the fish and casting them on the earth. Presently up came a woman, seeking fish and crying, Fish is not found to be found in the town. She caught sight of Caliph and said to him, Wilt thou sell this fish, O master? answered Caliph, I am going to turn it into clothes, tis all for sale, even my beard. Take what thou wilt. So she gave him a dinar, and she filled her basket. Then she went away, behold, up came another servant, seeking a dinar's worth of fish. Nor did the folk cease till it was the hour of mid-afternoon prayer, and Caliph had sold ten gold dinars worth of fish. Then, being faint and famished, he folded and shouldered his net, and repairing to the market, bought himself a woolen gown, a callet with a plated border, and a honey-colored turban for a dinar, receiving two dirhams by way of change, wherewith he purchased some fried cheese and a fat sheep's tail and honey, and set them in the oil man's platter, and ate till he was full, and his ribs felt cold from the mighty stuffing. Then he marched off to his lodgings in the magazine, clad in the gown and the honey-colored turban, and with nine golden dinars in his mouth, rejoicing that he had never in his life before seen. He entered and lay down, and could not sleep for anxious thoughts, and abode playing with the money half the night, and said to himself, happily, excuse me, the caliph may hear that I have gold, and say to Jafar, Go to Caliph the fisherman, and borrow us some money of him. If I give it to him, it will be no light matter to me, and if I give it not, he will torment me. But 
Torture is easier to me than the giving up of my cash. However, I will arise and make trial of myself, and if I have skin proof against stick or not. So he put off his clothes, and taking a sailor's plated whip of an hundred sixty strands, ceased not beating himself till his sides and body were all bloody, crying out at every stroke he dealt himself, and saying, Oh, Muslims, I am a poor man. Oh, Muslims, I am a poor man. O oh, Moslems, whence should I have gold? Whence should I have coin? Till the neighbors who dwelt with him in that place, hearing him crying and saying, Go to men of wealth and take of them, thought the thieves were torturing him to get money from him, and that he was praying for aidance. Accordingly, they flocked to him, each armed with some weapon, and finding the door of his lodging locked, and hearing him roar out for help, deemed that the thieves had come down upon him from the terrace roof, so they fell upon the door and burst it open. Then they entered and found him mother naked and bareheaded with body dripping of blood, and altogether in a sad pickle. So they asked him, What is the case in which we find thee? Hast thou lost thy wits, and hath gin madness betided thee this night? And he answered them, Nay. But I have gold with me, and I feared lest the caliph send to borrow of me, and it were no light matter to give him aught. Yet am I and gave him not tis only sure that he would put me to torture. Wherefore I rose to see if my skin were stick-proof or not. When they heard these words, they said to him, May Allah not assain thy body, unlucky madman that thou art. Of a surety, thou art fallen mad tonight. Lie down to sleep. May Allah never bless thee. How many thousand dinars hast thou that the caliph should come and borrow of thee? He replied, By Allah, I have not but nine dinars. And they all said, By Allah, he is not otherwise than passing rich. Then they left him, wondering at his want of wit. And Caliph took his cash and wrapped it in a ray, saying to himself, Where shall I hide all this gold? and I bury it, they will take it. If I put it on deposit, they will deny that I did so. And if I carry it on my head, they will snatch it. And if I tie it in my sleeve, they will cut it away. Presently, he spied a little breast pocket in the gown and said, By Allah, this is fine. Tis under my throat and hard by my mouth. And if any put his hand to hand it, it can come down on it and with my mouth and hide it in my throttle. So he set the rag containing the gold in the pocket and lay down, but slept not that night for suspicion and trouble and anxious thought. On the morrow he fared forth of his lodging on fishing intent and betaking himself to the river, went down out into the water up to his knees. Then he threw the net and shook it with might and main, whence the purse fell down into the stream. So he tore off the gown and turban and plunged in after it, saying, There is no majesty, there is no might, save in Allah, the glorious, the great. Nor did he give over diving and searching the stream bed till the day was half spent, but found not the purse. Now one saw him from afar, diving and plunging, and his gown and turban lying in the sun at a distance from him, with no one by them. So he watched him till he dived again, and dashed at the clothes and made off with him. Presently, Caliph came ashore, and missing his gown and turban was chagrined for their loss, and passing cark and care, and ascended a mount to look for some passerbys, of whom he might inquire concerning them, but he found none. Now, the caliph Harun al-Rashid had gone a-hunting and a-chasing that day, and returning at the time of the noon heat was oppressed thereby and thirsted. So he looked for water from afar, and seeing a naked man standing on the mound, said, Jafar, see what thou, see thou us what I see? And replied the wazir, Yes, O commander of the faithful, I see a man standing on a hillock. Al-Rashid asked, What is he? And Jafar answered, Happily is the garden of a cucumber plot, quoth the caliph. Perhaps he is a pious man. I would fain go to him alone, in desire of him his prayers, and abide ye where ye are. So he went up to Caliph, and saluting him in the slum, said to him, 
What art thou, O man? replied the fisherman. Dost thou not know me? I am Caliph the fisherman. And the caliph rejoined, What? The fisherman with the woolen gown and the honey-colored turban? When Caliph heard him name the clothes he had lost, he said in himself, This is he who took my duds, be like he did but just of me. So he came down from the knoll and said, Can I not take a noontide nap, but thou must trick me this trick? I saw thee take my gear, and know that it was thou that was joking with me. At this, laughter got the better of the caliph, and he said, What clothes hast thou lost? I know nothing of that whereof thou speakest, O caliph, cried the commander, <clears throat> cried the fisherman. By God the great, except thou give me back the gear, I will smash thy ribs with this staff. For he always carried a quarterstaff. Quoth the caliph, By Allah, I have not seen the things which thou speakest. And quoth the caliph, I will go with thee and take note of thy dwelling place, and complain of thee to the chief of police, so thou mayest not trick me again. By Allah, None took my gown and turban, but thou, and except thou give them back to me at once, I will throw thee off the back of that she-ass thou ridest, and come on down thy pate with this quarterstaff, till thou canst not stir. Thereupon he tugged at the bridle of the mule, so that she reared up on her hind legs, and the caliph said to himself, What calamity is this that I have fallen into with this madman? Then he pulled off the gown he had on, worth a um, hundred dinars, and said to Caliph, Take this gown in lieu of my own. He took it, and donning it, saw that it was too long. So he cut it off, short at the knees, and turbaned his head with the cut-off piece. Then said to the Caliph, What art thou, and what is thy craft? But why ask, thou art none other than a trumpeter? Al-Rashid asked, what showeth thee that I was a trumpeter by trade? And Caliph answered, Thy big nostrils and thy little mouth. Cried the Caliph, Well guessed, yes, I am of that craft. Then said Caliph, And thou wilt hearken to me, I will teach thee the art of fishing. Twill be better for thee than trumpeting, and thou may eat lawfully. Replied the Caliph, Teach it me so that I may see whether I am capable of learning it. And Caliph said, Come with me, O trumpeter. So the Caliph followed him down to the river and took the net from him whilst he taught him how to throw it. Then he cast it and drew it up when, behold, it was heavy. And the fisherman said, O trumpeter, and the net be caught on one of the rocks, drag it not too hard or it will break. And by Allah, <clears throat> I will take thy she-ass in payment thereof. The caliph laughed at his words, and drew up the net little by little, until he brought it ashore, and found it full of fish. Which when the caliph saw this, his reason fled, and presently he cried, By Allah, O trumpeter, thy luck is good in fishing. Never in my life will I part with thee. But now I mean to send thee to the fish bazaar. Where do thou inquire for the shop of Humad the fisherman, and say to him, My master Caliph saluteth thee, and biddeth thee send him a pair of frails and a knife, so he may bring thee more fish than yesterday. Rerun, and return to me forthright. The Caliph replied, and indeed he was laughing, On my head, O master, and mounting his mule, rode back to Jafar, who said to him, Tell me what hath betided thee. So the caliph told him all that had passed between Caliph the fisherman and himself from first to last, adding, I left him awaiting my return to him with the baskets, and I am resolved that he shall teach me how to scale fish and clean them. Quoth Jafar, And I will go with thee to sweep up the scales and clean out the shop. And the affair abode thus, till presently the caliph cried, O Jafar, I desire of thee that thou dispatch the young Mameluk, saying to them, Whoso bringeth me a fish from the beyond young fisherman, I will give him a dinar. But I love to eat of my own fishing. 
Accordingly, Jafar repeated to the young white slaves what the caliph had said, and directed them where to find the man. They came down upon Caliph and snatched the fish from him, and when he saw them and noted their goodliness, he doubted not but that they were of the black-eyed house of paradise. So he cut up a couple of the fish and ran into the river, saying, Oh, all of mine by the secret virtue of these fish, forgive me. Suddenly up came the chief eunuch, questing fish, but he found none. So seeing Caliph, ducking and rising in the water with the two fish in his hand, called out to him, saying, O oh, Caliph, what hast thou there? replied the fisherman, Two fish. And the eunuch said, Give them to me, and take an hundred dinars for them. Now when Caliph heard speak of a hundred dinars, he came up out of the water and cried, Hand over the hundred dinars. So the eunuch said, Follow me to the house of al-Rashid, and receive thy gold, O Caliph. Meanwhile, Caliph betook himself to Baghdad, clad as he were in the caliph's gown, which reached only to above his knees, turbaned with the piece he had cut off thereof, and girt about his middle with a rope, and he pushed through the center of the city. The folk fell a laughing and marveling at him, and saying, Whence hast thou that robe of honor? But he went on saying, Where is the house of al-Rashid? And they answered, Say, the house of al-Rashid. And he rejoined, Tis all the same and fared on till he came to the palace of the caliphate. Now he was seen by the tailor who had made the gown and who was standing at the door, and when he noticed it upon the fisherman, he said to him, For how many years hast thou had admission to the palace? The caliph replied, Ever since I was a little one. And the tailor asked, Whence hast thou that gown thou hast spoiled on this wise? The caliph answered, I had it of an apprentice, the trumpeter. Then he went up to the door, where he found the chief eunuch, sitting with the two fishes by his side, and seeing him sable black and hue, said to him, Wilt thou not bring the hundred dinars, O Uncle Tulip? Answered he, On my head, O Cal Caliph, when, behold, out came Jafar from the presence of the caliph, and seeing the fisherman talking with the eunuch, and saying to him, This is the reward of goodness, O Uncle Tulip, went in to al-Rashid, and said to him, O commander of the faithful, thy master the fisherman is with the chief eunuch, dunning him for a hundred dinars. Cried the caliph, Bring him to me, O Jafar. And the minister answered, Hearing and obeying. So he went out to the fisherman and said to him, O caliph, thine apprentice the trumpeter biddeth thee to call. And he walked on, followed by the others, till they reached the presence chamber when he saw the caliph seated and a canopy over his head. When he entered, al-Rashid wrote three scrolls and set them before him, and the fisherman said to him, So thou hast given up trumpeting and turned astrologer, quoth the caliph to him. Take thee a scroll. Now in the first he had written, Let him be given a gold piece. In the second, an hundred dinars. And in the third, let him be given a hundred blows with a whip. O Caliph put out his hand and by decree of the predecessor, he lighted on the scrolls wherein was written, Let him receive an hundred lashes. And the king won as they had ordained ought, go not back therefrom. So they threw him prone on the ground and beat him with a hundred blows, whilst he wept and roared for the succor, but not succored him, and said, By Allah, this is a good joke, O trumpeter. I teach thee fishing, and thou turnest astrologer, and drawest me an unlikely lot. Fie upon thee! Fie, fie in thee is not of good. When the caliph heard his speech, he fell fainting in a fit of laughter, and said, O oh, caliph, no harm shall betide thee, and fear not. Give him a hundred gold pieces. So they gave him a hundred dinars, and he went out and ceased not faring forth, till he came to the trunk market where he found the folk assembled in a ring about a broker, who was crying out and saying, An hundred dinars, less one dinar, a locked chest. So he pressed on and pushed through the crowd and said to the broker, Mine for an hundred dinars. The broker closed with him, and the other took his money, whereupon there was left him little nor much. The porters disputed a while about who should carry the chest, and presently all said, by Allah, none shall carry the chest but Zurak. And the folk said, 
Blue Eyes has the best right to it. And Zorak shouldered the chest after the goodliest fashion and walked a rear of Caliph. As they went along, the fisherman said to himself, I have nothing left to give the porter. How shall I rid myself of him? Now, I will traverse the main streets with him and lead him about till he weary and set it down and leave it when I will take it up and carry it to my lodging. Accordingly, he went round about the city with the porter from noontime to suntime till the man began to grumble and said, Oh, my Lord, where is thy house? Quoth Caliph, Yesterday I knew it, but today I have forgotten it. And the porter said, Give me my hire and take thy chest. But Caliph said, Go on at thy leisure till I bethink me where my house is. Presently adding, O oh, Zurach, I have no money with me. Tis all in my house, and I have forgotten where it is. As they were talking, there passed by them one who knew the fisherman and said to him, O oh, Caliph, what bringeth thee hither? Quoth the porter, O oh, uncle, where is Caliph's house? And he quoth he, Tis in the ruined Khan in the Rawasan quarter. And said Shirak to Caliph, Go to, would heaven, thou wouldst never lived nor been. And the fisherman trudged on following by the porter till they came to the place where the hamel said, O thou whose daily bread Allah cut off in this world, were we not past this place a score of times? Hast thou said to me, Tis in such a stead thou shouldst spare me this great toil, but now give me my wages, and let me wend my way. Caliph replied, Thou shalt have silver, if not gold. Stay here till I bring thee the same. So he entered his lodging, and taking a mallet he found there, studded with forty nails, wherewith, and he smote a camel he had made of it, rushed upon the porter, and raised his forearm, and strike him therewith. But Surat cried out at him, saying, Hold thy hand, I have no claim on thee, and fled. Now, having gotten rid of Hamel, Caliph carried the chest into the khan, whereupon the neighbors came down and flocked about him, saying, O Caliph, whence hast thou this robe in this chest? Quoth he, from my apprentice Al-Rashid, who gave them to me, and they said, The pimp is bad. Al-Rashid was assuredly here of his talk, and hang him over the door of his lodging, and hang all in the khan on account of the droll. This is a fine farce. Then they helped him to carry the chest into his lodging, and it filled the entire closet. Thus far, concerning Caliph, but as for the history of the chest, it was as follows. The Caliph had a Turkish slave girl by the name of Kut al Kulub, whom he loved with exceeding love. And the Lady Zubara came to know of this from himself, and was passing jealous of her, and secretly plotted mischief against her. So whilst the commander of the faithful was absent a sporting and a hunting, she sent for Kut al Kalub, and inviting her to a banquet set before her meat and wine, and she ate and drank. Now the wine was drugged with bang, so she slept, and Zubara sent for the chief eunuch, and putting her in a great chest, locked it and gave it to him, and saying, Take this chest and cast it into the river. Thereupon he took it up before him on a he-mule and set out with it for the sea, but found it unfit to carry. So as he passed by the trunk market, he saw the shake of the brokers and salesmen and said to him, Wilt thou sell me this chest, O uncle? The uncle replied, Yes, we will do this much. But, said the eunuch, Look thou sell it not except locked. And the other, tis well. We will do as thy ask. So he set down the chest, and they cried for a sale, saying, Who will buy this chest for a hundred dinars? And behold, up came Caliph the fisherman, and bought the chest after turning it over right and left. And there passed between him and the porter that which hath been set out. Now as regards Caliph the fisherman, he lay down on the chest to sleep, and presently Kut al awoke from her bang, and finding herself in the chest, cried out and said, Alas! Whereupon Cal Caliph sprang up the chest lid and cried out and said, Ho, Moslems! Come to my help! There are ifrits in the chest! So the neighbors awoke from the sleep and said to him, What matter at thee, O madman? Quoth he, The cloth and the chest is full of ifrits. 
and quoth they, Go to sleep. Thou hast troubled our rest this night. May Allah not bless thee. Go in and sleep without madness. He went on, I cannot sleep. But they abused him, and they went in and laid down once more. And behold, Kut al spoke and said, Where am I? Upon which Caliph fled forth the closet and said, O my neighbors of the hostry, come to my aid. Quoth thee, What hath befallen thee? Thou troublest thy neighbor's rest. O folk, there be ifrits in the chest, moving and speaking. Thou liest. What do they say? They say, Where am I? What heaven thou wert in hell? Thou disturbest the neighbors and hinderest them of sleep. Go to sleep. What thou hast never lived nor been. So Caliph went in, fearful, because he had no place wherein to sleep, save upon the chest lid, when, lo, as he stood with ears, listening for speech, Kut al spake again and said, I'm hungry. So in sore fright, he fled forth and cried out, Ho, neighbors, ho, dwellers in the con, come aid me. Said they, What is thy calamity now? And he answered, The ifrits in the chest say, We are hungry. Quoth the neighbors one to another, "'Twould seem Caliph is hungry. Let us feed him, and give him the supper arts, else he will not let us sleep tonight. So they brought him bread and meat and broken victuals and radishes, and gave him a basket full of all kinds of things, saying, "'Eat till thou be full, and go to sleep, and talk not, else will we break thy ribs, and beat thee to death this very night.' So he took the basket with the provant and entered his lodging. Now it was a moonlit night, and the moon shone in full sheen upon the chest and lit up the closet with its light. Seeing this, he sat down on his purchase and fell to eating of the food with both hands. Presently Kut al Kulub spake again and said, Open to me and have mercy upon me, O Moslems. So Caliph arose, and taking a stone he had by him, broke the chest open. And behold, therein lay a young lady, as she were the sun shining light, with brow flower white, face moon bright, cheeks of rose hue exquisite, and speech sweeter than sugar bite, and in dress worth a thousand dinars and more bedight. Seeing this, his wits flew from his head for joy, and he said, By Allah, thou art of the fair. She asked him, What art thou, O fellow? And he answered, O oh, my lady, I am Caliph the fisherman, quoth she, who brought me thither, and quoth he, I bought thee, and thou art my slave girl. Thereupon said she, I see on thee a robe of the raiment of the Caliph. So he told her all that had betided him from first to last, and how he had bought the chest, wherefore she knew that the lady Zubadah had played her false, and she ceased not talking with him till the morning, when she said to him, O oh, Caliph, Seek me from some one an ink case and reed pen and paper and bring them to me. So he found with one of the neighbors what she sought and brought it to her, whereupon she wrote a letter and folded and gave it to him, saying, O Caliph, take this paper and carry it to the jewel market. Where do thou inquire for the shop of Abu al Hasan, the jeweler, and give it to him? Answered the fisherman, O my lady, this name is difficult to me. Eh? I cannot remember it. And she rejoined, Then ask for the shop of Ibn al Uqba. Quoth he, O oh, my lady, is that an Uqba? And quoth she, Tis a bird which folk carry on fist with eyes hooded. And he exclaimed, O oh, my lady, I know it. And then he went forth from her and fared on repeating the name, lest it fade from his memory. But by the time he reached the jewel market, he had forgotten it. So he accosted one of the merchants and said to them, is there any here named after a bird? replied the merchant. Yes, thou meanest Ibn al Uqba. Khalif cried, That's the man I want, and I am making his way to him to give him a letter, which when he read and knew the purport, thereof he fell to kissing it and laying it on his head, for it said that Abu al Hasan was the agent of Lady Kut al Kulu, and are intended over all property and lands and houses. Now she had written to him saying, from her highness, the lady Kut al-Kulub, to Sir Abu al-Hassan, the jeweler. 
The instant this le letter reaches thee, set apart for us a saloon, completely equipped with furniture and vessels, and negro slaves and slave girls, and what not else is needful for our residence, and seemly, and take the bearer of the missive and carry him to the bath. Then clothe him in costly apparel, and do with him thus and thus. So he said, hearing and obeying, and locking up his shop, took the fisherman and bore him to the bath, where he committed him to one of the bathmen, that he might serve him according to custom. Then he went forth to carry on Lady Kut al orders. As for Caliph, he concluded of his lack in wit and stupidity that the bath was a prison, and said to the bathman, What crime have I committed that you should lay me in limbo? <laughs> they laughed at him and made him sit on the side of the tank, whilst the bathman took hold of his legs that he might shampoo them. Caliph thought he meant to wrestle with him and said to him, This is a wrestling place, and I knew not of it. Then he arose and, seizing the bathman's leg, lifted him up and threw him on the ground and broke his ribs. The man cried out for help, whereupon the other man, bathman came in in a crowd and fell upon Caliph, and overcoming him by dint of numbers, delivered their comrade from his clutches and tunded him till he came to himself. Then they knew that the fisherman was a simpleton and served him till Abu al-Hasan came back with a dress of rich stuff and clad him therein, after which he brought him a handsome she-mule, ready saddled, and taking by the hand, carried him forth of the bath, and said to him, Mount. Quoth he, How shall I mount? I fear lest she throw me on, on the ground and break my ribs into my belly. Nor would he back the mule, save after much travail and trouble, and they stinted not faring on, till they came to the place where Abu al-Hasan had set apart for the Lady Kut al Thereupon Caliph entered and found her sitting with slaves and eunuchs about her, and the porter at the door, staff in hand, who, when he saw the fisherman, sprang up and, kissing his hand, went forth before him till he brought him within the saloon. Here the fisherman saw what amazed his wits, and his eyes were dazzled by that which he beheld of riches past count, and slaves and servants who kissed his hand and said, May the bath be a blessing to thee. When he entered the saloon and drew near unto Kut al she sprang up to him and, taking him by the hand, seated him on a high mattress divan. Then she brought him a vase of sherbet of sugar, mingled with rose water and willow water, and he took it and drank it off and left not a single drop. Moreover, he ran his finger around the inside of the vessel and would have licked it, but she forbade him, saying, That is foul, quoth he silence this is not but good honey and she laughed at him and set before him a tray of meats whereof he ate his sufficiency then they brought a ewer of a basin of gold and he washed his right hand and abode in the gladdest of life and most honourable now hear what befell the commander of the faithful when he came back from his journey and found not kut al he questioned the lady zubida of her and said she is verily dead May thy head live, O prince of the true believers. But she had bidden dig a grave amiddlemost the palace, and had built over it a mock tomb for the knowledge of the love the caliph bore to Kut al So she said to him, O commander of the faithful, I made her a tomb amiddlemost of the palace and buried her there. Then she donned black, mere sham and pure pretense, and feigned mourning a great while. Now, Kut al knew that the caliph was come back from his hunting excursion, so he turned to Caliph and said to him, Arise, hie thee to the bath, and come back. So he rose and went to the hammam bath, and when he returned, she clad him in a dress worth a thousand dinars, and taught him manners and respectful bearing to superiors. Then said she to him, Go hence to the caliph, and say to him, O commander of the faithful, "'Tis my desire that this night thou deign be my guest. "'So Caliph arose and, mounting his she-mule, "'rode with the pages and the black slaves before him "'till he came to the palace of the caliphate. "'Quoth the wise, "'Dress up a stick and twill look chic. "'And indeed his comeliness was manifest, "'and his goodness and the folk marveled at this. "'Presently the chief eunuch saw him, and the same who had given him the hundred dinars that had been the cause of his good fortune. So he went into the caliph and said to him, O commander of the faithful, 
Caliph, the fisherman, is come a king, and on him is a robe of honor with a thousand dinars. The prince of the true believers bade admit him. So he entered and said, Peace be with thee, O commander of the faithful, and vice-regent of the Lord of the three worlds, and defender of the folks of the faith. Allah Almighty, prolong thy days, and honor thy dominion, and exalt thy degree to the hitmost height. The caliph looked at him, and marveled at him, and how fortune had come to him at unawares. Then he said to him, O caliph, whence hadst thou that robe which is upon thee? He replied, O commander of the faithful, it cometh from my house. Quoth the caliph, Hast thou then a house? And quoth the caliph, Yea, verily. And thou, O commander of the faithful, art my guest this day. Al-Rashid said, I alone, O caliph, or I and those who are with me. And he replied, Thou and whom thou wilt. So Jafar turned to him and said, We will be thy guest this night. Whereupon he kissed the ground again, and withdrawing mount his mules, and rode off attended by his servants and a suite of Mamelukes, leaving the caliph, marvelling at this, and saying to Jafar, Sawest thou caliph with his mule and dress, his white slaves and his dignity? But yesterday I knew him as a buffoon and a jester, and they marvelled much at this. Then they mounted and rode till they came near caliph's house. When the fisherman alighted and taking a bundle from one of his attendants, opened it and pulled out thereof a piece of tabby silk and spread it under the hoofs of the caliph's she mule. Then he brought out a piece of velvet kimcob and a third of fine satin and did with them likewise. And thus he spread well nigh twenty pieces of rich stuff till all Rashid and his suite had reached the house when he came forth and said, Bismillah, O commander of the faithful. Quoth al-Rashid to Jafar, I wonder whom this house may belong. And quoth he, It belonged to a, a man, Hight ibn al uqba syndicate of the jewellers. So the caliph dismounted, and entering with his courtiers, saw a high-builded saloon, spacious and boon, with couches on days, and carpets and divans strewn in place. So he went up to the couch that was set for himself on four legs of ivory, plated with glittering gold and covered with seven carpets. This pleased him, and behold, up came Caliph with eunuchs and little white slaves, bearing all manner of sherbets, compounded with sugar and lemon and perfumed with rose and willow water and the purest musk. The fishermen advanced and drank and gave the Caliph to drink, and the cupbearers came forward and served the rest of the company with the sherbets. Then Caliph brought a table spread with meats of various colors, and geese, and fowls, and other birds, saying, In the name of Allah. So they ate their fill, after which he bade them remove the tables, and kissing the ground three times before the caliph, craved his royal leave to bring wine and music. He granted him permission for this, and turning to Jafar, said to him, As my head liveth, the house and that which is therein is, is caliph's, for that he is ruler over it, and I am in admiration of him. Whence there came to him this passing prosperity and exceeding felicity. However, this is no great matter to him who saith the thing be, and it becometh. What I most wonder at is his understanding, how it hath increased, and whence he hath gotten his loftiness and his lordliness. But when Allah willeth well upon a man, he amendeth his intelligence before bringing him to worldly affluence. As they were talking, behold, up came Caliph followed by cup-bearing lads like moons, belted with zones of gold, who spread a cloth of cyclotron, and set thereon flagons of chinaware, and tall flasks of glass, and cups of crystal, and bottles, and hapnaps of all colors. And those flagons they filled with pure, clear, old wine, whose scent was as the fragrance of virgin musk, and it was even as the poet saith, Ply me, and also my mate be plied with pure wine pressed in the olden tide. Daughter of nobles, they lead her forth in raiment of goblets beautified. They belt her round with the brightest gems and pearls and unions and the ocean's pride. So I by these signs and signets know, wherefore the wine is entitled Bride. And round about these vessels were confections and flowers such as may not be surpassed. When al-Rashid saw this from Caliph, he inclined to him and smiled upon him and invested him with an office. So, o Caliph, 
wished him continuance of honor and endurance of days and said will the commander of the faithful dying give me leave to bring him a singer a, a lute player her like was never heard among mortals ever quoth the caliph thou art permitted so he kissed ground before him and going to a secret closet called kut al kulu who came after she had disguised and falsed and veiled herself tripping in her robes and trinkets and she kissed ground before the commander of the faithful then she sat down and tuning the lute touched its strings and played upon it till all present were like to faint for excess of delight after which she improvised these verses would heaven i wot will every time bring our beloveds back again and ah will union and its bliss be blessed two lovers dine will time assure to us a united days and joy and joy while from the storms and strows of life in safety we remain then o oh, who bade this pleasure be our parting past and gone and made one house our meeting stead throughout the nights contain by him draw near me love and closest cling to sight of me else were my weary wasted life a vanity and a bane when the caliph heard this he could not master himself but rent his raiment and fell down a swoon whereupon all who were present hastened to doff their dress and throw it over him whilst kut al signed to caliph and said to him hide to yonder chest and bring us what is therein for she had made ready therein a suit of the caliph's wear against the like of such an hour as this so caliph brought it to her and she threw it over the commander of the faithful who came to himself and knowing her for kut al kulub said is this the day of resurrection and hath allah quickened those who are in the tombs or am i asleep and this was an embryologio of dreams quoth kut al kulub we are on wake not on sleep and i am alive nor have i drained the cup of death then she told him all that had befallen her and indeed since he lost her life had not been light to him nor had slept been sweet and he abode now wandering then weeping and anon a fire for longing when she had made an end of her story the caliph rose and took her by the hand intending for her to go to the palace after he had kissed her inner lips and had strained her to his bosom whereupon caliph rose and said by allah o commander of the faithful thou hast already wronged me once and now thou wrongest me again quoth al rashid indeed thou speakest sooth o caliph and bade the wazir jafar give him what should satisfy him so he straightway gifted him with all for which he wished and assigned him a village the year revenues whereof were twenty thousand dinars moreover kut al kalub generously pressed him the house and all that was therein of furniture and hangings and white slaves and slave girls and eunuchs great and small so caliph became possessed of this passing affluence and exceedingly wealthy and took him a wife and prosperity taught him gravity and dignity and good fortune overwhelmed him the caliph enrolled him among his equiries and he abode in all solace of his life and its delights till he ceased and was admitted to the mercy of Allah. Furthermore, they relate a tale anent of Masur and Zain al-Mawasif. There was once in days of yore, and in ages and times long gone before, a man and a merchant, Masur Hait, who was of the comeliest of the folk of his tide, a white of wealth, galore, and in the earliest case, but he loved to take his pleasure in vergers and flower gardens and to divert himself with the love of the fair now it fortuned one night as he lay asleep he dreamt that he was in the garth of the loveliest wherein there were four birds and amongst them a dove white as polished silver that dove pleased him and for her grew up in his heart in an exceeding love presently he beheld a great bird swoop down on him and snatched the dove from his head and this was very grievous to him after which he awoke and not finding the bird strayed with his yearnings till morning when he said in himself there is no help but that i go to-day to some one who will expound to me this vision and shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased to say her permitted say 
and so do I cease my telling of this tale till it be morrow.